Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Samar Al Muntasar. I'm one of the pediatric neurologists in Al Jalila Hospital. I'll be talking to, today about the management of cerebral palsy in uh, childhood. I would like to thank the organizing committee for allowing me to be a part of this prestigious conference. Uh, my objectives of today will be uh, to define and overview cerebral palsy, classify and diagnose cerebral palsy, and majority of my talk will be about the management of cerebral palsy. The internationally agreed definition of cerebral palsy is a group of permanent disorders of development and mo or of movement and posture causing activity limitation that are attributed to non-progressive disturbance that occurred in the developing fetal or infant brain. It is usually accompanied by disturbance of sensation, perception, cognition, behavior, or by epilepsy, or by uh, secondary musculoskeletal problems. Cerebral palsy is the most common motor disability in childhood. It appears in the first few years of life the incidence is about one to four per thousand live births. It's a group of disorders that affect a person's ability to move, maintain balance and posture. It may be congenital that occurs before or at birth or acquired occurs few months after birth. The specific cause is often underdetermined, but the cartoon here showed us one of the hypotheses behind it which if a CNS pathology happens, you go into uh, two billards, either lose of the inhibition of lower motor neurons, giving you a positive features of upper motor neuron syndromes that includes spasticity, hyperreflexia and clonus, or the other arm is lose of connection of the lower motor leading to negative features of upper motor syndromes, including weakness, impaired selective motor control, poor coordination, and both at the end, if not targeted or treated, will lead to dynamic deformities. If not as well treated, will uh, go into fixed deformities. Prematurity and low birth weight is one of the greatest risk factors to develop cerebral palsy. What are the types or classifications of cerebral palsy? You have three um, uh, main categories. First, you categorize it based on the anatomical location, and you have, if you have one limb, so you call it monoplegia, two limbs in one side, you call it hemiplegia, two limbs in the lower limbs, we call it diaplegia, four limbs, we call it quadriplegia. In terms of the motor abnormality of physiological function we have the majority is spasticity dyskinetic including um, dystonia or choreoathetoiosis ataxia hypotonia or mixed of all in terms of the severity of condition you assess the function using the gross motor function classification uh, score and we will be talking about in the coming slides because spasticity is the majority, around 85% of children with spasticity has, uh, uh, sorry, with cerebral palsy has spasticity and hypertonia, we'll, my coming slides will be talking about spasticity. So first of all, we define it. So spasticity is a velocity-dependent resistance to passive movement of a joint and its muscles. In simple English, it is abnormal increase in the muscle tone or stiffness of the muscle tone, which interferes with the movement, speech, gait, or can be associated with discomfort or pain. The most common types in spasticity is spastic hemiplegia, that we see it with patients with strokes. It affects one side, and it's the most common type in spasticity. Spastic diaplegia, we see it more and more in patients with prematurity, that affects both lower limbs. Spastic quadriplegia, four limbs are all affected and sometimes associated with cognitive or other neurological disorders. And the main reason where you get quadriplegia is either hypoxic ischemic changes or traumatic brain injury. 
We all know that the diagnosis of cerebral palsy is clinically based. You will receive a patient referred to your clinic based on delayed motor milestones or abnormal neurological examinations, persistence of primitive reflexes or abnormal postural reactions. Diagnosis is easier if the brain images can be identified by neuroimaging. So many tools we use to assess spasticity in children. One of them is rating scale of spasticity. The most common type is modified Ashford scale to measure spasticity. We use the help of our physiotherapist and neurohab in doing the measures. And the other types also are present, including the geniometry, which we can easily use it in our clinic as well. The goal standing of measuring the function is using the gross motor function classification that shows to be valid, reliable, and responsive to the clinical management of and changes in cerebral palsy. What is it include as based on this cartoon? It is one into five scales, scores, sorry. Grade one, which is level one, is when you assess, and you assess in this, you assess the patient's posture and walking and ability to stand. So if the patient is able to walk, stand, and go up the stairs without any problem, he is in level one. And if he grading the specificity based on that, you reach the level four or five, sorry, four and five, where he is using a wheelchair and fully dependent or, or caregiver. Again, the same measures can be used in upper limbs and it's most commonly used by our uh, occupational therapists and uh, physiotherapists. Gait assessment is important to be used, especially for our ambulant patients. If you want to assess the therapy that you are using and how much it's helping in improving his walking, the gold standing assessment is the three dimensional gait analysis. And we are looking to forward to open our gate in Al Jalila Hospital soon, inshallah. In the next coming slides, I will be talking about the common pattern of spasticity, and I will give you a few uh, slides about it. I'll talk mainly about the lower limbs because it is again the most common uh, uh, deformity that we see. First, uh, equinovarus foot. What is it? It's the most frequent malposition of the lower limb in spasticity in children and in adults, where the foot will be flexed at the ankle and pointing downward and inward. This position, if you are lying or sitting, was will cause pressure in your laterals in the lateral side of the patient and lead to skin irritation and callus malformation. If you are trying to walk, so there will be uh, pain at the lateral border of that foot. So because of that, patients with severe equinovirus will be unable to walk. So we know the muscles are causing the internal rotation are the tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior. And we know that these are targeted muscles where we can target it by physiotherapy and uh, other modalities that we are going to talk about. Bis valgus, where the patient tilts his foot toward outside, and there will be flexion at the toe to help him balance. And there will be always permanent uh, pressure at the knee joints, causing uh, uh, knock knee deformity and pain at the medial uh, border of the foot because he's trying to balance his, his, um, his pos posturing uh, by pressing on the medial border of the foot. Another example is extension of the big toe, and the muscle affected here is the extensor hallucis longus. So there will be a persistent extension of the big toe that if you if the patient is wearing shoes, that leads to pain at the tip of the toe and cause as well skin irritation and ulcer formation. Knee flexion spasticity, the targeted muscle here as are the hamstrings. So it affects, if you see the positioning, so you will not be able to open the um, popliteal region that will uh, hinder the hygiene area. Also, it will affect, because he's not able to 
extend his knee, he won't be able to balance, sit, stand, or walk. And hip flexion spasticity, that the affected muscles are the iliopsoas and the hamstrings, and will cause shortening of that the affected limb with toe, tiptoe uh, standing and walking, and will hinder, again, the ability to walk and standing and the hygiene of the genital um, area. Adductor spasticity of the thighs. We all know about this common sign, which is called the scissoring sign. And you can see the degree of severity in each patient. This can affect the standing, walking, and even changing diaper and hygiene in the genital area as well. Toe flexor spasticity seen uh, mainly following stroke and uh, affects the posturing, standing, and um, ability to walk. Now we come to the main uh, talk about today is the management and cerebral palsy. First of all, managing patients with cerebral palsy will be so difficult if there was no mutual consent between the therapist and the patients. So when you, when you have a patient you have to establish the goals of treatment with the parents before you start, because sometimes par parents' expectation can, can be beyond the patients and the uh, management ability. So the main goals for patients with spasticity, first you address what is the clinical problem here, what types of spasticity, which limb is affected, and what is the parents looking to improve. In function? Is it the mobility, the care, deformity, pain, or contractures? And your decision on treatment will be based on the distribution, severity, location, and comorbidity of the spasticity. We traditionally use the step ladder approach to manage the high tone. The first two, removing nauseous and rehabilitation down in the bottom, are the main cornerstones and they have to be always present and regular for the patients to help improve his uh, spasticity. The other, the other starting from oral, oral medication, orthopedic procedures, neurosurgical procedures are add-ons that we try to help and ease the pain and reduce the comorbidities and need of surgical intervention for these patients. I'll be talking about uh, uh, each one of them one by one with focus on mainly on their chemo denervation using botulinum toxins. So numerous treatment options is there, but the main and holistic or main cornerstone is using the rehabilitation, daily, regular physiotherapy and occupational therapy. First line of management along with the physiotherapy will be using uh, medications and will be tailored upon the patient's request, whether he's having spasticity or dystonia. And we have a long list here. You can see uh, starting from baclofen, benzodiazepine, clonidine, carbidopa, gabapentin, and trihexyphenidates. I came across a study that say, uh, was conducted in the UK and it, it compared these all management that I have uh, showed earlier in treating dystonia, spasticity, or choreoathetoid. And they found that baclofen is clinically significant in patients with spasticity. Uh, however, trihexyphenidyl and gabapentin are more effective in dystonia. Other interventions, I'll be talking about the surgical one and I'll keep the talk about Botox at the end. Baclofen bump into the spinal cord is one of the surgical interventions that has been uh, used. So the idea is to introduce a catheter into the spinal fluid. So directly we will deliver baclofen through a reservoir that will be um, attached to the abdominal wall from inside and it will give a small and daily effective uh, baclofen directly into the CSF, and that will help and reduce dystonia and spasticity. We in Jalila started the ITP program since January this year, and we have two patients started on the baclofen with good results, and the list is growing. 
Other surgical intervention include selective dosal rhizotomy for patients with spastic diplegia and deep brain stimulation, mainly for patients with severe dystonia and uh, severe spastic quadriplegia. Now we'll come about my major topic is using chemo denervation with botulinism toxin or phenol in treating uh, spasticity. It was first reported to use botulism toxin in children in the early 90s in the United States and the United Kingdom. And since then, the use of it has become a standard of care for, for many countries. Now we use it in ambulant and non-ambulant patients and the indication for ambulant using it in focal muscles in the lower limbs is to improve gait and function in the upper limbs to improve posture and function and if it is used in a non-ambulant patient the target will be analgesic effect we use it in stage one of spasticity where we still have dynamic contractures that again we will tell the parents that we use it to relax the muscle, that you get the maximum benefit of physiotherapy and orthotics. Mechanism of action of botulinism toxin is to pre-synaptically synaptically block the acetylcholine from being released, and this will cause uh, muscle relaxation. And we use it uh, for children between average age four to 17. And I personally used it in younger age and it is safe and cause uh, good results. The dosage we are using, so uh, personally, I uh, based on the muscle I am targeting, if it is a small muscle of the upper limbs, for example, I use two to three units per kg. If it is for big muscles like the hamstring and gastrox, I use around uh, four to six units per kg. And we don't exceed beyond 200 to 400 based on the body weight of the patients. We target the muscle by anatomical landmark, which is proven to be a poor accuracy. We practice in Jalila by EMG or electromyographic uh, machine where you deliver electrical stimulation and while doing that, the muscle will contract and tell you which muscle we, we, you are in and you can deliver uh, the, the, the medicine um, with confidence. Recently, they advocate the use of ultrasound to help more uh, accuracy. Clinically, you start find improving in the first few weeks or two weeks after injections. I personally, uh, put my uh, patients into serial casting for the first two months till the botulinism toxin effect comes. This effect will last between three to six months based on the patient's response. We can repeat it uh, and adjust the dose uh, with uh, intervals between three to six months. Um, the long-term effect, there is no irreversible changes that happen with the botulism toxins. So uh, basically, it is safe to be used. This is uh, one of the, my patients who received the first injections to his gastrox uh, uh, because of the two walking. He's a premature, uh, premature child, and he started toe walking, and we gave him the first dose. And this is him two weeks later after casting with his uh, foot and first of all, able to walk with ease and his uh, foot sole is flat and there is no imbalance. And you can see that he can do all the activities with confidence. He will stand with both legs flat on the floor. This is another patient, history of prematurity as well, received Botox to her gastrox, followed by serial casting for two weeks, and she is perfectly well walking. And this is just a cartoon showing the same example of two walking, 
after botox it becomes uh, become down his foot into the floor and it was very easy for him to use the uh, walker afos and to participate in physiotherapy another another article i came across it's uh, comparing the use of pharmacological and neurosurgical intervention for this treatment of dystonia in cerebral palsy this is uk based um, uh, article so they used medications uh, chemodenervation injections intrathecal baclofen and deep brain stimulation and they concluded with the following that intrathecal baclofen and deep brain stimulation possibly effective in reducing dystonia and there is no current evidence to support the effectiveness of oral or botulinum toxin to reduce dystonia in summary the main treatment goal of for patients with spasticity due to cerebral palsy is to improve the motor function improve posture and independence minimize pain and contractures and deformities enhance efficacy of the physiotherapy program and reduce the need of surgery particularly between the age of two and six and all these achievements can only occur if there is a consent between the therapist and the parents for what type of uh, goal you are looking for chemo denervation with botulinism toxins results in significant decrease in spasticity and pain improved range of motion and ability to function independently and ease hygiene care as well we always advocate combining using any of the treatments along with the botulinism toxin with the physiotherapy for patients with spasticity and that will help and give the maximum benefits for muscles and improve range of motion and all the above mentioned activities here in Jalila, we have uh, uh, since September 2021, around 80 cases who received multi-level uh, chemodenervation injections to treat spasticity under general and local anesthesia. Most of them on regular physio and uh, splinting. Post injections, we will do for, for them serial casting. Majority of our patients are spastic diplegia and prematurity rest are the quadriplegic uh, cerebral palsies. We are looking to publish our, uh, our data soon with uh, the clinical effectiveness and uh, um, uh, recommendations. So please stay tuned. And um, this is my reference. Um, I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you very much again to the organizing committee and Dr. Tarek for the invitation. If you have any questions, please let me know.